I'm going to tell you a true little story. Um, it has nothing to do with salmon. Uh, the true story is about after I'd been working here for about two years, one day in class, somebody said, well, tell me about the best creative you ever worked with in, when you were in the business. And I said, Rich Levy. And that's the truth. I worked with a lot of great people around the world, but I never worked with anybody better than this. So, Rich Levy. Ironically, when people ask me the best account people I've ever worked with, um, well, anyway. So uh, thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is pretty incredible to be up here. Um, this is kind of like doing a TED talk, you know? I actually feel like I should have letters behind me. Um, I decided to call my presentation, Healthcare Advertising Doesn't Suck, um, because I work in healthcare advertising, as, as many of you know. Um, and I interview a lot of people. I interview lots of people for, who are coming in, people who are looking for jobs at all different levels. And many people ask me, why should I consider healthcare advertising? Why should I choose healthcare advertising as a career? Why should I do it? All of those things. And the reason why they question whether they should do it or not is because they've heard they've seen, they've experienced healthcare advertising as it was in the past, and it sucked. And they're like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that type of advertising. So what I'm here to tell you is that it's different, it's changing, and that it is really an, a great opportunity for a career. Um, but we'll get to all that in a minute. So I was told by these guys that I, that I should talk about myself for a few minutes. So I will talk about myself for a very few minutes. Um, here's a little about myself. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I've been doing this for over 30 years. God, I can't even believe I'm saying those words. Um, but I didn't sort of grow up in an advertising family. My dad was a plumber. My mother was a homemaker. And if you think about it, that was really the perfect opportunity. First of all, I feel very at home, knee deep in crap. Um, but it, the other thing is that my father, as a plumber, always had to figure out how to do things. There's no sort of straight way to do it. You would walk into a job site, and everyone would be different. Every job would be different. Every challenge would be different. And he would have to figure out a way how to do it and use a lot of creativity to do it. Um, and I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot about hard work. I learned a lot about paying dues. And I learned a lot about never really giving up. So I think over my course of my career, the thing that I've learned the most is never give up. Always stick to your guns. Always do what you believe, and you'll be OK. So that's the absolute truth. After all this time, I still absolutely love doing what I do. I mean, imagine that. Imagine after 30 years of a career that you could say, I love coming to work every day. I love doing what I do. I love working with people and watching their careers grow. I've worked with people who are now running their own agencies, who own their own agencies, who are doing work that are winning unimaginable creative awards. And it makes me feel really glad to see their careers also grow as mine has. Um, so that's me. That's what I look like. Um, but when I graduated, how many seniors are here? Seniors? Uh, excellent. So this is what I looked like my senior year of college. So I had no idea back then what would happen. I had no idea what my career would be. As a matter of fact, I did not go to college to be in advertising. I was going to be a journalist. I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, and I graduated with a degree in communications with a specialty in journalism. And I got out of school, and I did what every good college senior does. I got my very first job as a lifeguard, because <laughs> I couldn't get a job. And then I became a newspaper reporter, hated that. And then I found advertising. And I was a retail copywriter. Then I was a copywriter, then a copywriter, then a copywriter, then a senior copywriter, senior copywriter again. Then through a whole bunch of mergers, 
Um, I became an associate creative director, creative director, back to an associate creative director after someone realized I didn't know how to be a creative director. Um, creative director, creative director, creative director, blah, 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 blah. I had no idea what path my career would take. I had no idea that I would have that many jobs. I would have no idea that I would actually work on the client side at Verizon for a while. I had no idea that I would work in healthcare advertising. I had no idea that I would shoot commercials on virtually every continent. Um, I've shot close to 250 commercials in my career, and I've traveled all around the world. Um, but I didn't know any of that when I was a senior in college. Matter of fact, the only thing I knew was that I had lots of ideas and that I needed a way to express them <clears throat> and that I wanted to do something that was fulfilling and I wanted to do something that would make me happy. And I eventually found advertising. It was sort of that epiphany moment. When I first went to my first agency and got my first job, um, I felt free. I felt I, I had the ability to create things that had never been done before, to change beliefs, change behaviors, change attitudes. But again, I didn't know any of that. Um, and what has happened in the time since, a lot of companies went out of business. The one thing that you have to learn about this industry is that agencies come and agencies go. Agencies merge and agencies disappear. But that if you really stick to it and you really love it, there are a whole list of agencies that still were not even born when I began my career. So there's a whole lot of opportunity and a whole lot of fun out there. I've worked on some incredible products. I, I mean, this is just a small list of the products that I've worked on. Um, everything from giants like Coca-Cola, Bank of America, Sony, to small regional companies like Hood Dairy. And the reason why I put Hood Dairy on there is because I met my wife, who is a client at Hood Dairy. Yes, I married one of my clients. <laughs> um, and uh, she would kill me if I didn't put it up there. But um, I've really had some incredible opportunities. Um, so you might ask, what was, actually someone did ask me earlier, what was my big breakthrough moment? And I really find that there were three. My career has really been defined by three distinct moments in time. The first one, Dutch Boy Paint. You wouldn't think of it as a breakthrough moment. I was very early in my career, and I had the opportunity to do a campaign for Dutch Boy Paint. And the brief was very simple. Get people to paint their houses. OK. But why? Dutch boy paint versus any other paint. Why choose this one? How am I going to convince people to paint their house in the middle of the summer when it's really hot and you don't want to be painting your house? Well, we came up with a really simple idea. And the simple idea was based on a truth, which is when you paint your house, when you go to sell it, it's worth more. And we created a campaign where what we did is we went to this really disgusting, ugly house in the middle of Baltimore, Maryland, and we had all these appraisers come in and appraise the house. And it was all worth whatever it was worth, I don't remember. And then we painted the house, inside and out, over the course of three or four days. Then we filmed the rest of the commercial, and we had appraisers come in and reappraise the house. And the value of the house almost doubled. And we did nothing but paint it. And we created this campaign that just said something, it said when Dutch Boy goes on, the value goes up. And paint sales went through the roof for Dutch Boy Paint. And the campaign got a lot of notoriety. It was the first time in my career that a campaign that I wrote, that I created, got national press. And I liked it. <laughs> I liked it a lot. And what's interesting about when you get press is that a lot of people come knocking on your door. And all of a sudden, people want to hire you. And people want you to go work on their brands. And people want you to go do, do things. So I actually left that job not long after creating that campaign and, and went to an agency in St. Louis to work on Budweiser, which was an enormous opportunity to do 
huge national television commercials for, at the time, one of the largest advertisers in the nation. So this was breakthrough n moment number one, do work that gets noticed, do work that gets press, and really don't take an assignment at face value. I think one of the reasons why I got the assignment was that nobody else wanted it. It seemed like an awful project, paint. Nobody wanted paint, you know. Later in my career, I did something on, on Duncan Hines' cake mixes. Nobody wanted to work on cake mixes. There are no really small opportunities. There are huge opportunities waiting to be made. And you can create something out of nothing in any category. The second big breakthrough was Verizon Wireless. I had been working on what had been known as the Bell Atlantic 9X mobile account for several years. And they were merging and coming up with a brand new company called Verizon. And they needed a big campaign. And we had come up with lots of campaign ideas. As a matter of fact, we did, came up with a campaign that was tested so well in research that we were getting ready to do it. Um, and the basic idea of the campaign, I think this is important to talk about, is because before we came up with that, we were in a completely different space. So swing back, take yourself back to 2001. Um, cell phone coverage is not like it was today. Matter of fact, one of the biggest obstacles with buying cell phones at the time was that they were always dropping calls. They weren't working. Um, this was pre-digital, this was analog, and, and, and people were dropping calls right and left. So we came up with a campaign where we were going to shoot live commercials and have people use their phones. And what we were going to do is we were going to have a gigantic map of the United States, and we were going to have someone throw a dart at a map, and wherever that dart stuck, we were going to go to that place, shoot commercials, and we were going to hand someone a phone and see if it worked. Anywhere. Anywhere in the country. And then we we're going to have that person throw a dart at the map, and that would be the next commercial, the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. We tested this all over the country, and people loved the idea because it showed confidence. Wow, if they're willing to throw a dart, they must be really confident that wherever the dart sticks, it's going to work. It showed leadership. It showed all of the national scope, national coverage. People loved it. And the people at Verizon loved it. They were like, oh my god, this is a huge idea. So to make it work, I had a meeting with the people at Network. Because we had to see where our phones worked. Because part of the, <laughs> because part of the trick of the campaign was we owned the map. So the places that we put on the map basically were going to be places where we knew that Verizon was going to work. So I had a meeting with the people at Network, and I asked a very simple question. Can you tell me where our phones work and our competitors don't? And they all looked at each other and all gave those quizzical glances of all, only network engineers can. <laughs> and then a woman, her name was Lynn Gioka, and I will never forget Lynn as long as I live. Um, Lynn Gioka was a junior brand manager on the Verizon account. And she said, well, we have these things called the DeMarco drive tests. And I said, well, what are the DeMarco drive tests? And she said, well, we have these people who drive around the country testing our network. And because it's computerized and it's in a van, they test it every three or four feet to see where we work and likewise where our competitors don't. So we can improve our network all around the country. And I said, wait a minute. You have a guy that drives around the country testing the network every three feet. He goes, yeah. I was like, OK, thank you. It's all I need. For the next hour, from Basking Ridge, New Jersey, to my office in Manhattan, I left the absolute longest voicemail message to myself ever. Like, oh my god, they have these guys, blah, blah, blah. They drive around the country, and they test the thing every three feet. And it became this campaign, a guy walking around the country testing the network every three feet, saying, can you hear me now? Now, interesting. Now, imagine trying to sell that to a client. What we're doing is we're pointing out that it doesn't work, right? Because when would people say, can you hear me now? When it's not working, right? But it was the vernacular. It was what people were saying. It was how they were speaking. And we also followed it up with the word good. Can you hear me now? Good. Can you hear me now? Good. So we didn't test the campaign. Testing was over. We had already tested the other stuff. 
but someone at Verizon thought it could be a big hit. And they gave us the budget to shoot one commercial. One. They were going to launch this gigantic new campaign and shoot one commercial. So we went out and we shot our one commercial and it was an enormous, enormous hit. And the reason I knew it was an enormous hit because in one week, Jay Leno did a spoof, Saturday Night Live did a spoof, um, there had been numerous political cartoons written. I have in my office back in New York, I have two political cartoons um, that were written um, about it. And it became like this crazy thing overnight. So of course we rushed back out and we shot, uh, shot 11 more commercials in a nanosecond. Um, but it was a life-changing moment because I realized two things. One, I thought I was creating this campaign over here. And to create that one, I found a, a nugget of information that took me completely over here. And I created something completely different. And I had spent months on this. Months. And I spent a day on this. And this changed my career. And you have to be ready for that. You have to be ready that just when you think you have it all figured out, that you don't, that you're going to go in a completely different direction, that someone's going to say something that says, no, we're not going there, we're going to a different place. Or, I know we've worked on this for months and months and months, but I'm going to change strategy, and now we're going to create completely different work. So you have to be incredibly flexible and ready for that moment, for when that inspirational moment comes. Um, I worked on this for almost 10 years. Um, I shot well over 150 commercials. I've traveled everywhere just doing that. Luckily, as a copywriter, I knew what the line was. Um, and it was very easy for me to do, but it was a lot of fun. Um, but I don't know if I was prepared for that. I, I, I wasn't prepared for that change when it came. Luckily, I was um, open enough to see it and not close it down because I had invested so much time over here. I mean, let's think about it. Let's say you're working on an assignment that you've been given in class and you've worked for a week on creating these pieces and then the day before it's due, you come up with a huge idea. That means redoing it all, but redoing it in a day. What would you do? Would you do it? Or would you stick with what this over here because it was tested? You know everyone loves it. It's the path of least resistance. It's a hell of a lot less work. Most people would. But I thought, we knew this was big. We knew this was bigger. We went for it, even though a lot of people thought we were crazy. And it was big. The next breakthrough moment was this. When I switched to healthcare advertising, people told me I was crazy. They told me you could never do creative work. They told me that it was a dead end. They told me it was career limiting. All those things that you've heard. And I set my sights on, I wanted to be a crazy good creative agency. That we were going to win, this is called a Manny Award, Medical Advertising News, that we were going to win the most creative agency award in 2010. And then we won it again in 11. And then we won it again in 12. And then we won it again in 13. Um, hopefully we'll win it again in 14, <laughs> April. I'll let you know. Um, the reason why this is a life-changing moment is it proved to me that it's possible. It's, proved, it's proven to me that if you really stick to your guns and you really want it and you really want to work hard, that you can make huge, huge differences, is that if you hire the right people and you give them the ability to think outside the box, that you can do enormous things. It takes a lot of dreaming. Um, this was proof that it's possible. But it's really only possible because of a hell of a lot of people who've come along for the ride who say, yep, I can do it. Yes, we're allowed to make mistakes. Yes, this is going to be hard. My creative department at Draft FCB 
healthcare is over 250 people. We all are pulling together in the same way. We all have each other's back. We know that we're going to make mistakes. We know there's going to be failure. Fail failure. We know there's going to be clients who will not come to our agency because they don't want the type of work that we do. And you know what? That's OK. I don't want to be for everyone. I want to be for the type of clients who want the type of work that we do. And you know, we don't do the same as everyone else. So it was a life-changing moment for me because I knew that it was possible. I knew that we could do something different. And now I do work for clients like this who are not known to be the most creative, who are not known to be big risk takers. But you know what? They are. They've become that way. They've realized that they have to do something different to stand out in the marketplace. As a matter of fact, when most people think of healthcare advertising, they actually think of something more like this. Hey, Mom, what do you say to a game of tennis? Come on, Grandma. If you on our side, the boys don't stand a chance. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll get my racket. Um, on second thought, I think I'd better sit this one out. Well, you kids go ahead. I want to have a talk with your old grandma. You're still having control problems, aren't you? I just don't feel confident, Harvey. Come with me. I want to let you in on a little secret. Here we are. Oops, I crapped my pants. Oops, I crapped my pants. I've heard of those. Do they work? Oops, I crapped my pants. I've performed every bladder and bowel control product on the market today. Here, let me show you. Now imagine this pitcher of iced tea is really a gallon of your feces. Now see how a super thick fluff filter allows for maximum absorbency without leaking. I'm impressed. Oops, I crap my pants can hold a lot of dung. And get this. Oops, I crap my pants are biodegradable. Now that's good for the environment. Hey, how do you know so much about oops, I crap my pants? I'm wearing them, and I just did. <laughs> Thanks, oops, I crap my pants. Visit your local pharmacist and just say, oops, I crap my pants, from Procter & Gamble. The reason why it's funny is because it plays on every stereotype known to man, right, in, in healthcare advertising. You say the name of the product 300 times. It's the bad demo in the middle. And healthcare advertising really was like that. I mean, that's why it was funny, and in many cases, there are clients who still want to do work like this, but we're seeing that diminish over time. But there are three basic myths about healthcare that that unfortunately plays into. Healthcare advertising will limit my career. I interview two to three people a week. Every single person who comes into my office asks that question, will this limit my career? And my answer to that is, depends what career you want. Do you want a career where you're inventing products? Do you want a career where you're creating things that don't exist, that you're launching brand new products that people have never heard before, that you are making a real difference in people's lives, that you're getting to break new ground and do things that have never been done before? If the answer is yes, then yeah, that's what we do in healthcare advertising. We do gigantic campaigns in print and digital and social and all of those things, just like regular advertising. The difference is our clients have a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> the difference is our industry is growing. The difference is I have more jobs than I can hire. I could hire every single person in this room and still have jobs left over. Um, <laughs> I guess this is over. Yeah, so is it career limiting? I don't think so. I think it's the most exciting time to be in a brand new industry. I mean, think about it. healthcare advertising has really only been around for a little over 20 years. And they're still figuring it out. And it's going through a monumental shift from, oops, I crap my pants, to where everything is going today. You can be on the forefront. You can be those guys who are saying, no, I'm not going to do crappy advertising. You are going to be those people who make the difference and change or not. And so is it limiting? I don't think so. I think it's a brilliant place to begin a career, keep it a career, and start from the very, very beginning. Um, I have a lot of Syracuse alums on my staff. Um, and uh, so anyway, it's a good place. 
Uh, second one, it's where creative people go to die. Um, it's been, it, think about it. When healthcare advertising started 20 odd years ago, the way it started was all the people who couldn't get jobs in general advertising found, ooh, there's a whole new source of jobs. So it was a lot of really, really, really old people. I mean, people who I look at and think they're old, okay? So like really old people. Um, but luckily they've all died. And, um, and we're replacing them with younger. So no, it's, um, it's changed. The industry has really changed and um, everything about it is different. So if you are looking at it as a way to start a career, it's a great place to start. And the creative, and look, we talked about this. Everyone thinks the work sucks. I'm about to prove to you that it doesn't. Because um, those, a lot of those were true, but unfortunately they were true 25 years ago. And a lot of things about advertising has changed over time. I often ask people I interview, name a product who does great advertising. Aim, name someone that you think is just brilliantly beautiful design, great copy, and seven out of 10 times, Apple. And go, oh yeah, Apple, they're great. Oh, Apple, I love Apple. I want to do work like Apple. Well, you know what? You know what kind of work Apple used to do? This used to be Apple. How do I, I mean, that was Apple. They weren't always so great. You know, you know this great iPhone 5? You know what their handheld advertising used to look like? It used to look like this. So everything changes over time. Two years ago, the biggest winner at Cannes was Old Spice. Anybody remember what Old Spice advertising used to look like? Anybody buying musk? <laughs> How many guys here are wearing musk? Raise your hand. OK, yeah, nobody. Thank God. Oh, the guy from France. OK, so, um, so, so I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pick on you. I, I apologize. So, <laughs> so things really change. Um, this year at Cannes, huge campaign, right? Won every imaginable award, Titanium Lion. But Dove Advertising used to look like that. Right? It took people to challenge convention. It took people to say, I want to do something different. And Dove went from $1 off coupons to creating a campaign for real beauty, to celebrating people who had their own personal beauty, to celebrate people, to let them know what was possible for them. So really, advertising has changed dramatically, and healthcare advertising has changed with it, maybe not at the same pace, but it's definitely changing. Um, so why did it suck? And I'm going to be very honest here. Uh, it sucked for three reasons. One, the biggest excuse, the FDA. Yes, we answer to a higher calling, and I don't mean the almighty. It's the FDA. Everything we create has to go before a governmental board, the Food, Food and Drug Administration. And they are tough. But it's an excuse. We do not start there. We do not end there. What they give us is guidance, not law. So what we need to do is we need to figure out a way of being brilliantly creative and not worry about the FDA. Because could you imagine a consumer advertising brand who had to put 30 to 45 seconds of crap in the middle of their commercial that tells you all the side effects of their product. I actually did it to an Oreo commercial just to show my client what it would look like. And this is what I did. I put a wish under my pillow And I hope it does come true I put a wish under my pillow And I dreamed all night of you I put a wish into my heart And I held it for safekeeping And now suddenly it's creeping Oreo is a cookie that contains 7 grams of fat, 24 grams of carbohydrates, and should not replace fruits and vegetables as part of a healthy diet. 
Indulging in Oreos could lead to obesity, diabetes, hypertension, low sex drive, dry mouth, constipation, and blackening of teeth. Before eating Oreos, discuss all other cookies and cakes you're eating with your physician. Stop eating Oreos immediately if you've noticed people calling you a muffin top or endlessly rubbing your stomach like a statue of Buddha. If your spouse leaves you for someone thinner, this may be considered a severe side effect of eating too many Oreos. And now suddenly it's creeping Happy Father's Day Into my dreams I dreamed we'd never be apart And we'd always have this If anybody else had to do what we had to do, it would be you know, they would fight like crazy, right? That was an incredibly memorable Father's Day commercial that our agency did for Oreo, and yet it loses so much of the impact by having to have what they call fair balance in the middle of the commercial. Um, so the FDA is definitely one excuse that people use of why healthcare advertising has not been good in the past. The other is clients. They say, oh, we have Really, 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 really conservative clients. Guess what? Every client is conservative. Um, no matter where you work, because there are millions and millions and millions of dollars at stake. Um, a true story, um, the people at Bayer ran a campaign for a contraceptive called Yaz. Um, they spent over $50 million in media. Um, on television, they ran a commercial on the Super Bowl saying how great their product was. And the FDA came back and said that they had made a false claim in their advertising. And they had to run what was called corrective advertising, which was, you may have seen a commercial recently saying, and they had to spend the same amount of money that they spent on their original campaign in excess of $50 million, including running an ad on the Super Bowl. A lot of money's at stake. So don't make changes, uh, don't, make, don't make mistakes, but clients get very conservative. So what you need to do is make it safe, is to make it okay, is to let them know that they're not clients, that they're partners, that when you work with people and you explain why you're trying to do something, why you're trying to help their business, you can make enormous friends. And when you make enormous friends and their careers start to increase, it's not just about your career, but about their career, you can do great things together. We've done some amazing things for our clients, but it does take a level of trust and risk taking. I've never created a great campaign that hasn't taken some risk. Um, somebody had to raise their hand and say, I like it, I want to do it. Um, those, are, those are great clients to know. The third excuse is that everything worked in the past. This is a real live, real live print ad for something called Flomax, which is for people who have to go to the bathroom a lot. Crappy advertising worked. This was a multi-billion dollar brand. And people said, well, I don't have to work so hard to be successful. So they got very lazy and did very, very boring advertising. But these tricks don't work anymore. The FDA. Not really that much of a problem if you know how to create. If you still, if you think about gigantic ideas and then worry about how to do it, clients are not as conservative anymore because they can't be. They don't have these blockbuster products anymore that people are just going to run to. And Me Too, crummy, uninspired advertising isn't going to work anymore. So they have to t take more risks. They have to do things differently. And that's where we come in. Because God only knows we want to do stuff that's not formulaic, that's highly risky, and that's much more interesting to do. So that's all changing. And it's changing right now. And it's changing for those of you who want to make it change. And I'll give you a couple examples. Advertising for psoriasis. Ooh, ooh, psoriasis, right? Skin, ugh, right? This is what psoriasis advertising has looked like for years, right? Happy person doing benign thing, riding bike. Let's see the product. Look at this massively brilliant headline. 
once daily effective psoriasis therapy. Oh my God, I can't imagine the copywriter who wrote that. Uh, a stroke of brilliance. Um, oh, let's, 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 no, 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 but the brilliance is in the subhead. Oh, help your patients treat their psoriasis. There is none. So for all of you who want to be copywriters, I'm sure you can do much better than this, but this was acceptable. It worked, but it's changed. What is the latest type of advertising that's being done for psoriasis? It's much different. It's much more beautiful. It's much more evocative in trying to make you feel something. It's much more in your face. It's not the happy, shiny patient. It's someone who's in pain, who's embarrassed, who doesn't want to show their face, who is ready to try anything to make it go away. And the brilliant thing is this product makes almost 90% of it go away within whatever the regimen is, 12 weeks, something like that. Truly can help someone, but is much more, much more emotional. And it rings much truer. This is what a ad looked like for sleep disorder. Here's someone who couldn't sleep. And God knows I don't want someone with a razor at my neck if they can't fall asleep. The problem is I don't care. I don't care if my barber can't sleep. I don't have a razor at my neck that often. And it makes me not really care about the product or care about the category. But there are people who I care very, very much if they can perform their job at night. And I, there are lots of people who I can think about. For example, I want my firefighter to be, to be uh, wide awake if they're coming to my house, an EMT worker, anyone who works in the streets. So the idea became, who are those people that we want to support? And let's stop making it a joke and making it serious and take it to a completely different level of thinking, supporting those who stay awake for, the, awake for the rest of us. These people are doing this, disrupting their entire lives for us. We didn't ask them to do it. They volunteered to do it, but they're saving lives for us. They're working for us. They're helping us. So we thought it was much more important. Here's a scary thing. Everything on this wall right now has won an award in healthcare advertising over the last seven, eight years. I think this was 2002 that I pulled these, or 2004 that I pulled these from. This is garbage. This is the old school. This is what everyone is moving away from. This is easy. I could do this blindfolded. I could do this without even trying. But now it's changed. It's much more emotional. The type of work that's happening is much different. This happens to be for irritable bowel disease. And if, if you've ne ever known anyone who has Crohn's or colitis or anything like that, this is what it feels like. They feel like they're trapped. Breathing disorders. Peanut allergies. Here's a very interesting thing. This is as simple as simple can be. All we did was we told people that if you have a peanut allergy, you may not have one that bad, and that all you need to do is get a very simple test. And you know those really, really, really conservative clients that I showed you a, a picture a minute ago? Take a look at this actor here. Actually, the kid's name was Oliver. <laughs> T take a look at Oliver. For Halloween, our clients dressed up like Oliver. <laughs> and the reason they dressed up like Oliver was because sales went like that. We took, yeah. Matter of fact, they had to stop advertising because manufacturing could not keep up with, with, with orders. Uh, they were getting so many orders that they were flooded and they were like, okay, stop, pull back, stop. We made their life so easy by coming up with something very simple. And they became our best friend. So there's endless opportunity. There is so much opportunity in healthcare advertising to do incredible work, to have incredible careers, 
to do whatever you want and to be absolutely limitless. But there's three things I want you to know. The industry is growing. The industry is growing by double digits every year. There are hundreds of new products that are get launched every year. You go on any healthcare website for any healthcare major pharmaceutical company and they have a section called pipeline. All the things that are in clinical development and you look and every major healthcare company has 10, 15, 20 things in clinical development. Now you times that by all the healthcare companies and there are hundreds and hundreds of pipeline products that are waiting to be named, to have brands, to help people, to be invented, to have great campaigns, to have digital and social media. All of these things are just waiting to be created and there's hundreds of them waiting, hundreds of stories to be told. There are hundreds of jobs to be filled. At my agency alone, today, in my creative department, I have 40 job openings. I can't fill the jobs as fast as we get them. 40. In the entire agency, we have over 130. Probably 130-ish people here. I could hire everyone in this room, and still tomorrow we're, we're going to win another piece of business and have more job openings. We win business faster than we can fill the jobs. The agency is growing that quickly. And then there's another secret that I hesitate to tell you, but I decided I would tell you. Starting salaries in healthcare and general advertising are about the same. But within two years, you're making about 20% more. And that compounds year over year over year over year. So by the time you get to my level, <laughs> I love healthcare advertising. It is a, it's a great place to be. It's a great career, great place to, to um, flourish and do really, really well. So I asked Ed to send me a few questions. Oh, that doesn't suck, right? Um, a couple of questions. And the first question that I thought was very interesting is what do I look for in a potential new hire? It's really simple. I look for interesting people. I look for people with a story. I look for people who, who come into my office and demand for me to pay attention to them. I look for people who have weird hobbies. You know that little line at the bottom that says other interests and you write a couple of things in there? Really think about those because those are the first thing people like me go for. We look at all of those interests. interests. You speak Mandarin Chinese? Love that. You played on your college ultimate Frisbee team? Love that. Yeah, whatever it is, it's something that makes you interesting because when you leave the office, you go do all of those things and you bring all of those experiences into the office and the more diverse the workplace and the more diverse the interests are, the better the work. So what am I looking for? Really smart, really interesting people. What's the most important thing seniors should be doing right now? And I decided that this question was so huge that I'm going to devote the next 10 minutes to this. And I have 10 tips to land your, great, your first great job. Okay, so this is really important. Now, I am going to, who wants a spring internship? Anybody want a spring internship? Or, or summer, how about summer internship? Okay, if you want a summer internship, I'm going to ask a question. The first person to get it right and volunteer, I'm gonna guarantee a summer internship, okay? So pay attention, because I'm gonna ask someone to come right here in a minute, okay? So first tip, have at least six Great, underline great campaigns in your portfolio, website, PDF. Three's too few, nine's too many. If you don't have six, you're screwed. Okay, so if you're a senior right now and you're putting together an online portfolio, PDF, and you're thinking, ooh, I only have one or two, get moving. Because you need a lot more than that. You need at least six really good, well thought through, multi-channel, not just print, not just television, digital, right, mobile, social, well thought out campaigns. And the reason why you need that many is because 
I could look at the first one. It could be great. I don't know if that was an accident or not. I don't know if you can really think, so I look at a second. And if the second one stinks, I'm like, ooh, maybe it was an accident. I look at, then I'll look at a third. If that third one's good, then I'm sort of like, hmm, I'm not sure. If that one's bad, I stop looking. You've lost. So make sure they're great. You are only as good as the worst thing in your portfolio, OK? So I want you to look at your portfolios, and I want you to look at them with a very, very critical eye. And whatever you decide is the worst thing, just know that's the thing that's representing you, OK? So you're only as good as the worst thing, so get to work. The second thing, control the conversation. What do I mean by that? I want you to feature your strengths and hide your weaknesses. I'm going to show you two different portfolios, online portfolios. Priscilla, Dylan. Priscilla had lots of good work, at least she thought. So she put together a website that allows me to go in and choose wherever I want. Dylan had not as much great work. Matter of fact, I had to, you had to scroll down and get there. But he controlled where I went. So Priscilla's best campaign was right there. Where did I go? Right there. I didn't like that campaign. So I went to another one. I went right above it. That one wasn't that good either. So I stopped looking. And I never knew that campaign and that campaign and that one were all great. Because she didn't control the conversation. She let me decide where to go. Dylan, on the other hand, I have no choice but to go here first. When, oops, when I clicked down, I naturally went here, and then here, and here. I liked all of them. Interestingly, Priscilla was a much better creative than Dylan. Dylan was brilliant at a few things. She was a much better creative, but her portfolio betrayed her because she didn't control where I went. So I highly recommend to everyone is to Create a website, responsive, make sure it works on mobile, responsive website, where you control where the viewer goes. Okay? And realize that 99% of the time, you are sending your work ahead of time as a, port, as, a port, as a link to a website, to a PDF, something, right? That you are not getting that in-person interview until someone has viewed your work ahead of time. So you are not controlling it in the room. So make sure you control the conversation by how you create your work. Next, research. Know the agency that you're going to see. Know the person you're going to see. Know everything about them. Know some work that they do. Because if you're interviewing for a job, at one point or another, the person interviewing you is going to say, what do you like about us? Why do you want to come work here? What work do we do that you like? And if you don't know, you're screwed. You are really, really, really screwed. So here's the test. I need a volunteer. Who wants a spring intern? Who wants an internship in the, in the summer? Someone, anybody, want, anyone want an internship? Right there, you, come on up. Come on up. Guaranteed internship. But you gotta answer a question right. Come on up. Stand right here. What's your name? Danielle Fields. Hi, nice to meet you. What do you want to be? Um, I want to be an account executive. Oh, okay, Sorry. no, perfect. Now it's fine. Okay. Danielle, what's the first question I'm going to ask you in an inter interview? Tell me a little about yourself. Exactly right. <laughs> How do you know that answer to that question? How do I know the answer? Yep. Well, I'm going to, how am I going to answer No. It? How did you know that I was going to ask you that first? Because I want to know about you and what you can bring to the table. Ooh, that was the world's luckiest guess. Thank you. You get, you get, you win. The reason why I say do your research, I wrote that on my website. The, here it is. Here's the answer. Tell me something about yourself. It is the first question that I ask every single person that comes into my office, and you have no idea how many people are, are not prepared. Now keep in mind, what is the purpose of an interview? Anybody. What's the purpose of an interview? Yes. Exactly, to make sure that you're not an idiot, right? I want to get to know the people who are, in my, who are coming into my department. 
I want to make sure that the people fit in. So I want to know about you. I've already seen your work. I already like your work. You wouldn't be sitting there if I didn't like your work. So by the way, the reason I put that up there is that everything you need to know about me, my agency, what I like, what I dislike, is on my website. I write a blog at least once a week, if not more. I've given you all the answers. And many other creative directors are doing the exact same thing. So make sure you do your research. It's all there. I created the cheat sheet. Hire a proofreader. Seven out of 10 resumes that I see have typos in it. I see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of resumes. I can't tell you how many have typos in them. If you have a typo, you don't get to see me. And many people like me. So hire, even if it's your, a friend, pay them in pizza. I don't care what, how you pay them, but don't do it yourself. You can't see your own typos. Trust me. I teach a class at Fashion Institute in advertising portfolio. First day of class, I had everyone pin their resume up on the wall. And I told people that I would fail them if there was a typo. 17 of the 20 people took their resumes off the wall. And the three people who left them up there, luckily they didn't have typos. They were confident. Hire a proofreader is incredibly important. Next, rehearse. Rehearse practice. Don't do anything cold. Know what you want to say, know what you want to show, all of those things. I actually videotape my students. I interview every single person and I videotape them. Why? Because it reveals something about yourself that you wouldn't know. This woman right here, I asked her a question. She said the word like 22 times in the answer of the first question. So like, so like I like, oh my God, stop already, please. This woman here, you see that scarf around her neck? You know why she's wearing that scarf? Is every time I asked her to present, she started blushing so much, so red, that it was uncomfortable for me as the interviewer to look at. I knew she was so nervous and she was like unbelievable. This, this guy right over here loved himself <laughs> like there is no tomorrow. He was all about, look at me. I don't care what you're going to ask, I'm going to tell you about what I want. It was like the perfect political debate <laughs> where no matter what they asked, he was going to tell me what he wanted to. By the way, he works for me right now. Because uh, <laughs> I love that. I, I love that he didn't follow the questions. So rehearse. <laughs> Definitely practice. Because practice is everything. You wouldn't get up in front of your classmates to do an enormous presentation without rehearsing. Why come into a room where you're definitely going to be nervous? You definitely don't know what I'm going to ask. You have no control of the situation and practice without rehearsal. This is very important. Know what you're going to wear before the morning of the, of the interview. I can't tell you how many people look like they come into an interview with what they wore the night before. <laughs> it is really important. Now, I know this is going to sound ridiculously sexist, okay? but I'm going to say it. Women, if you have to pull on the bottom of your skirt, it's too short. If you have to adjust your bra strap, get it adjusted. Because I can't tell you how many times I'm sitting in an interview and someone's going like this the whole time or going like this the whole time. You're nervous. I get it. I understand. Dress like you are going to sit on the floor. Okay? Dress like, so you don't have to think about it. Dress like it's your first day of work, just a little bit nicer, okay? Because again, the purpose of an interview is to see if you fit in with my creative department. So you don't dress too much, because people don't dress like that in advertising, <laughs> right? But you don't want to be, I rolled out of the bar last night, and this is what I, I wore last night, and it smelled like cigarettes. Yeah, you don't want to be there either. Oh, and please, don't wear too much cologne or too much perfume, OK? Because I can't get you out of my office fast enough if you, <laughs> if you had those, OK? So, so really, think about what you're going to wear. Again, you are selling yourself. 
This is a package, right? Think about how you're going to package it. Your portfolio, what does it come in? Is it an iPad? Is it something else? Is it a laptop? Is the laptop in a holder? All of those things are packaging. Think about every little thing because it does matter. Prepare questions. This is the number one most important thing. I can't believe I put it seventh. At some point, I'm going to ask you, do you have any questions for me? I can't tell you how many people say, no, you've answered all of my questions. I don't care if I've answered all your questions. Ask a question because I want to know how you're thinking. Prepare. Even if you have a pad in front of you, write down three or four or five questions because it allows the interviewer into your mind how you're thinking, the things that are important to you. Now, here are the things never to ask. Okay, how much vacation time do I get? <laughs> what are the office hours? What is the starting salary? How many holidays do I get off? Um, but there's other ways of getting to those questions. Tell me about the work-life work balance at the agency. That's a perfectly acceptable question. But if you get to all of those things, someone in HR is going to get to those. Don't waste my time with those questions. If I want to hire you, we'll tell you exactly how many vacation days you're getting, how much uh, how holidays, and all of those other things. So don't worry about that. Ask questions. Perfectly good question. What type of person succeeds here? How, how do people get promoted? What is your idea of the perfect candidate? All of those things. And keep in mind, part of the object of asking the question is to get the interviewer talking. You are interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. Okay? You don't want to work at every agency. There are certain agencies that have lots of jerks. There are lots of agencies that do terrible work. There are lots of agencies that are really dead-end jobs. Don't forget, you are interviewing them. Don't forget that. Don't be boring. I can't tell you how many people I meet who just sit there and I have nothing to say. Keep in mind, I am meeting you for the very first time. I know nothing about you. If you are boring me to tears, I'm going to get you out of my office as quickly as humanly possible. And that's not a good way to get a job. Have a story. I don't care what that story is. I don't even care if that story is true. <laughs> but have a story. Right? How did you come to be here? Why do you want to be in New York? Uh, have something. Tell me some story. And I always give my students at, at FIT, I give them a story. Here's the story that I want you to tell me. I want you to tell me that moment that you decided that you wanted to be in advertising. What was that epiphany moment? What was that moment where you said, I can do that. I can create something. I want to create something like that better than that. I can make a difference. What was that moment that went off in your head that was like, I can't imagine doing anything else but this. And that everything that I've been trained to do in school, everything that I've been trained to do over the course of my internships have prepared me for this moment sitting here across from you right now. So if you can't come up with your own story, use that one. Because trust me, the director's like, love that one. <laughs> Don't be late. If you're late, you're dead. Right? If you have a meeting with me at 9 o'clock and you show up at 9.10, I don't see you. Right? So don't be late. I mean, I know that sounds really like simple. Can't tell you how many people break that rule. Intern and never leave. This is a big one. Intern, intern, intern. I have a guy who works for me right now. His name is David Hurwitz. David Hurwitz, I gave an internship to because he had the world's worst portfolio. And he went to Temple University, my alma mater. And I felt so guilty that my university had not prepared David for a job in advertising that I gave him an internship. And I told him why. I said, your portfolio is awful. And I'm going to beat you into a pulp for the next three months while you are here interning. But by the time you leave here, you will have a portfolio that will help you get a job. You will have experience that will help you get a job. And you will know how to think. His internship ended. And you know what he did? He didn't leave. He was like, you know, I'll just hang around. I'll work for free. 
I'll do whatever I can. He just wouldn't leave. And our <laughs> HR group said, well, we can't do that. We can't let someone just hang around. It's an insurance risk. Whatever the reason was, I don't remember what it was, but we couldn't let him just hang around. So we gave him a job. And he's doing really well. And he's just been promoted twice in three years. He turned it all around because we taught him how to do it. Um, he turned it around because he didn't give up. When I told him he had the world's worst portfolio, he could have walked out of my office and said, that guy is a complete jerk. I never want to see him again. I'm going to run away and I'm going to find someone who thinks I'm brilliant. He could have. Nobody would have, but <laughs> he could have. But instead he said, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to figure out a way of doing it. He persevered. And he did amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. So those are my 10 tips. But I have another final thought, and then I know we have some questions, and I'm sorry, I know I'm going way over, way long. Um, keep this in mind. This is not a career for everyone, OK? Advertising, whether it be healthcare advertising or non-healthcare advertising, is really, really hard. You are trying to come up with an idea that's going to be game-changing. You're trying to come up with an idea and then convince someone else that it's game-changing. And then once you convince them, you want to convince eight people around a focus room table at a Holiday Inn in Parsippany, New Jersey, that your idea is brilliant. Then you have to sell it up through a corporate ladder. Then you have to shoot it, produce it, get it on the air, and you have millions of people think it's a good idea. It's really hard, but it's so amazing. And you need to care. The number one thing you need to do is make people care. Because only when you get them to care and you change a belief can you possibly begin to change a behavior. And that's what we're trying to do in advertising, is change behavior. So healthcare advertising doesn't suck, but it definitely needs more people like you. It needs more people who have not been brought up in healthcare advertising, people who don't know the rules, people who are not handcuffed by the rules, people who can make a difference and see something and say, I don't care that it's never been done before. I want to do it. And I want to figure out a way of doing it. It's an amazing time. It's more fun than is probably legally allowed. <laughs> the fact that I get paid every day to work with hundreds of amazing people is incredible. The fact that I can set my own destiny, and that started when I looked like that crazy bearded guy back in college. I started on this path and never knew where it was going to take me. I'm, but I'm so glad it's brought me here today to talk to you guys. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? So we have, um, five minutes for a few days. <laughs> yes. Sure. So, so the question is, do I think about all the ethical and FDA considerations uh, when creating a project? Um, to answer your question, eventually I think about all of that. But I don't start there. And the reason why I don't start there is I'm looking for an enormous idea. I'm looking for ideas that are just so huge and so large that a client can't say no to it. And so what happens is you start here with this gigantic idea. And then at some point, I try to figure out how I'm going to get that legally approved. Okay, But I don't start there. Because if I started with, how am I going to get that legally approved, then the ideas start here. And they start with all the things that I can do. I want to think about all the things that I can't do. I want to think about all those things that I'm not allowed to do, and then figure out a way of doing it. I'll give you a perfect example with that. Uh, one of our products um, is a drug for multiple sclerosis. 
And social media in healthcare advertising is very difficult because healthcare companies don't like not being able to control the conversation because sometimes consumers will say things that are not really true. I took this drug and it cured me. Well, no, it didn't, but it helped you deal with your symptoms. But that, having that out there is actually illegal. Um, but we figured out a way of doing it, and by having a moderated Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all things like that, it allowed us to get to a social media presence where it had never been done before. But if you asked the legal department, they would say, no, you can't do it. But we were like, we didn't settle there, and we figured out a way to do it. So I think that if you start with those considerations, you're dead, dead in the water. But eventually, you have to get there and figure it out. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Um, it sounds like you're really interested in like changing the way yes. the industry looks at you know ad ad healthcare advertising. Yes. Like how eager are the clients um, to do the same to push those boundaries? Well, it depends on the client, to be honest. Uh, well, first of all, I think I hit healthcare advertising at exactly the right moment. I was very, very lucky because. Everything had been one way for so long that it stopped working. And people had kept doing the same old tried and true, and it stopped working. So they needed something different. They needed someone to push them in a different way, to make them feel uncomfortable. And I happened to be in the right place at the right time and willing to make that push. So do clients want it? I think they need, they, they need it. I'm not sure they want it, but they know they need it. And it's hard. And so what you need to do is make it not as hard. You need to wrap it in insight and data and information to make it easier for them to sell up to their management. Um, you need to have conviction. You need to believe in it that it's not only good creatively and going to make your career as a creative person, but it's going to make their career and that they are going to succeed and they're going to get that next promotion and all of those things. And you can't think of it short term. You have to think about moving things incrementally over time. And then all of a sudden, you're all the way over here when you started over there. And, and we barely noticed. The smaller the company, the easier it is for them to change. The larger the company, the more difficult, because there's more layers. Also, small companies need to make gigantic changes to be heard. They're being outspent 5, 10, 15, 20 to 1. So, um, I think clients need it. They know they need it. And now's the time. Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? I think we'll start again. Oh, okay. Thank you.